Welcome, everybody. My name is Christina. I am going to be one of your hosts for tonight. Um, quick thing about us, in case this, if this is your first time on a virtual event, uh, we are from the Abrams Engel Institute for the Visual Arts, colloquially known as AVA. We are a visual arts center located on the campus of the University of Alabama at Birmingham. We present eight to 10 exhibits a year, highlighting a mix of regionally, nationally, and internationally acclaimed artists focus almost exclusively on contemporary art. We serve a diverse audience of university faculty, staff, and students, but also artists, museum patrons, and donors. We help represent the visual arts at UAB to local and regional institutions, but also the national and international art community while simultaneously striving to keep our exhibitions directly relevant and engaging to our surrounding Birmingham communities. Since opening in 2014, Ava has been featured in publications such as the New York Times, the Huffington Post, the Nation, Raw Vision Magazine, and PBS Canvas. And we are very proud that our exhibitions and related educational programming are free and open to the public. So thank you all for coming. Um, and we are on the bottom floor of the building, but the top floor is the Department of Art and Art History. So we are constantly surrounded by students, faculty, and staff. And this event is actually one of those that is um, was the the brainchild of one of our student organizations, the Student Arts Council. And a uh, quick shout out to any of the students on the call. And if you are a student and you're not in our Student Arts Council and you want to know more, um, we are accepting applications. Uh, they are due September 10th. Um, and just reach out to us and ava at uab.edu and we'll get that sent over to you guys. You can also find it on Engage as well. <laughs> so uh, feel free to apply. Those are open until September 10th. Okay, so before I get uh, started, a uh, couple of things uh, to draw your attention to tonight. The Visual and Performing Arts at U uh, UAB is excited about their upcoming year of programming. Um, we've got a lot of things going on. Some are in Zoom, some are going to be in person. So please keep checking back on our social media and our web pages for more information. You've seen a scrolling through several of the upcoming events. Um, so for example, we're bringing back the Mental Health Mondays with the Institute of Arts, to Arts and Medicine. We've got a Lunch and Learn coming up on September 15th. That one's actually gonna be in person, but we're also bringing back virtual Lunch and Learns as well through Art Play. Art Play also offers classes uh, not for course credit. <laughs> uh, they are offered for all ages, including pre-K all the way up through adult. So if you're ever interested in taking a visual or a performing arts class, um, be sure to check out Art Play. The registration is open for all of those. Uh, Alice Stevens Center will be bringing back performances in person, and um, there will be a host of lectures, tours, chamber music, spoken word event, plenty of uh, opportunities to engage with Ava, our art museum, um, for our fall exhibition, Marking Time, Art in the Age of Mass Incarceration. So more information is on our website. And in fact, our next Outside the Lines uh, will be October 7th, and it will feature one of the artists from the show, Tamika Cole. Um, so be sure to uh, look that up and sign up for that one as well. And that will be on October 7th. So um, quick housekeeping notes. Uh, please note that discriminatory or hate language of any kind will not be tolerated. The session is being recorded, but know the recordings are largely just the screen shares and then also the spotlights of Rich and I. So we want to encourage you to, and feel comfortable to turn on your screens. This is a night to decompress, color, and participate in the discussion about art. So we really encourage you guys to ask questions. At the bottom of your screen is a chat feature. Drop any questions you have there, and I will ask them as time allows. Um, but... Uh, we are going to go ahead. We are now going to go ahead and get started um, with our event, and which features Department of Art and Art History Professor and Chair Rich Gear. Welcome, Rich. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read uh, your. Your bio. So uh, tell everybody a little bit more about you. Rich Gear is professor and chair of Department of Art and Art History at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He previously served as professor and chair of the Department of Art and Design at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi, where he was also co-director of the Center for Arts in Nursing. As part of a $3 million Health Resources and Service Administration grant, his research is focused on collaborating to integrate the visual arts as pedagogy into nursing and medical curricula. He also formally held the positions of Director of Fine Arts at the Savannah College of Art and Design and as Principal Partner for the Design House 
Otter Art and Design LLC. He was uh, he has worked with clients around the country, including HGTV, Food Network, DIY, The Rose Bowl, C, C Ray Boats, Mercedes Benz Stadium, and many others. In addition, he has developed and owned several design patents. He recently served as an organizing liaison to the Southern Graphics Council International Conference in Dallas, Texas, the stateside steering committee for the 2020 conference in Puerto Rico, and served as the membership committee board for the Art Museum of South Texas. As an artist, educator, and arts administrator, Rich has been instrumental in program development in Corpus Christi, Texas, Atlanta, Georgia, Knoxville, Tennessee, Savannah, Georgia, and the Ecole des Arts du Lacoste in Provence, France. Uh, Rich works in print media, alternative photo processes, works of paper, sculpture, installation, and time-based media, and is a 2021 recipient of an Atelier Stéphane Guilbaud residency in Paris and Bergerac, France. I apologize. Yes, I no, you got it. You got it. That's great. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Recent exhibits include the El Paso Museum, El Paso, Texas, uh, Museum, Museo de Arte de Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, the Louis, uh, Louis Carnegie Gallery Print, Austin, Austin, Texas, Scope Basel, Switzerland, Art Helix Gallery, Brooklyn, New York, and the Toolbox Gallery, Berlin, in Germany. Rich maintains an active studio practice in Birmingham and is represented by Marsha Wood Gallery of Atlanta, Georgia. So welcome, Rich. That is there. I learned a lot um, going through you. your bio today that I didn't know from before. So <laughs> I'm really excited for us to uh, get talking. So welcome. Very to be here. I, I just, I love you guys. Um, and I, I'm so pleased that students were the impetus of this whole project because I've sat in on and watched several that I've really enjoyed. And it was nice to, to meet, uh, you know, colleagues that I've been working with for a couple of years here and then learn a lot more about them, like you just said. So, so thank yeah. you. It, it's been, uh, it's been really fun and we're really glad um, to have you with us. And then also for this series to continue, we weren't sure we would be able to keep doing it. Um, but the pandemic is still with us and we're happy that everybody is able to still and wants to still join us via Zoom. Um, so Rich, let's go ahead and get started. I, first, I want to make sure everyone can see um, the PowerPoint, correct? Excellent. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so Rich, uh, why don't we start off with you telling us what led you to become an artist? Uh, well, based on the first slide, you know, we might say divine intervention, but that's not the case. Uh, this is um, this is actually a picture of the center of the hometown that I grew up with in, in, in uh, Leverett, Massachusetts. And across the street from this, there's a post office. That is the whole town. Uh, I was very fortunate and privileged uh, growing up. You know, we lived, I describe it sometimes as uh growing up in a Norman Rockwell painting uh, because it was the sixties and we were in this kind of like isolated rural community near a college town. My dad was a professor and my mom taught at a college too. And um, so literally this is all there is in the middle of this town. And it's still to this day, it looks exactly the same. So next slide. However, about 100 feet down from the post office is what used to be Leverett's only industry. And at the turn of the millennium, uh, not the last one, but the one before that, uh, they made wooden, like beautiful wooden crates for specialty items like, you know, scientific instruments and things that had to be shipped. And it was called the box shop and it, and it was uh, deteriorated. Um, it, would, it had been abandoned for 50 years. and so uh, in the 60s, it was taken over by a group of hippies, and it was turned into the Leverett Arts and Crafts Center, which it, it continues to be today. So this was exactly halfway between the farm that I grew up on and the elementary school. So from third grade, whenever, whenever the weather allowed, you know, through sixth grade, we rode our bikes to school and back. And every day on the way back, we stopped at the Leverett Arts and Crafts Center. And everybody in the community was involved. Like our Paul Woodard, our 
bus driver was a tinsmith and my first grade teacher, Annette Gibovic, was a potter. And my fifth grade teacher, Robert, Robert Abbey, was a, uh, a, a abstract painter. Of course, he, he wasn't very good, but that's also where I started my art criticism career as well. So, um, so I actually grew up because we, we didn't like see the surrounding communities until we went to a regional junior high school. Uh, so I, I grew up thinking that everybody was a maker because everybody in my community was everybody that we saw at church and in the community and everything, they, they did stuff and it, and it was around. And so we were kind of surrounded by that creativity and I did it by, you know, I took classes there and I just kept doing it. When I went to college, I went and got a degree in the social sciences because I kind of felt like it was expected of me. And as soon as I was done, I turned around and and enrolled uh, in art school. And so um, that's that's kind of the, the genesis of it. That's uh, an amazing influence. So does the small town in particular play a role in your work or the nature around it? What, what yeah. influences particularly your early work? So because I grew up on a farm, we were never allowed in the house. Uh, you know, we had a barn and we had a shop and an outbuilding and a carriage shed and all. And so, and it was a gentleman's farm. I mean, it wasn't like we produced anything. We had a garden, we had some horses and, uh, stuff like that. But, um, but because of that, we were outside all the time. And so just being outside became, and you can, you can go through a couple slides here. So just being outside and the stillness and the connectivity, whether it's on water, I spent a lot of time on the water as well as in the woods. Um, and you know, that became a big element of how I worked. And so, um, so if you take a look at this piece, uh, it's, it's kind of a connection of grabbing a hold of certain themes and using that that natural or ecological aspect of creating the work this this piece i put in i i don't know why it's an older piece but you know when i was uh going off to graduate school and stuff and my my mom and dad were like you know uh we want you to have something special so they gave me this set of encyclopedias and this set of encyclopedias is called um the uh, uh, oh, I forget. It's um, but it's it's the it's about raising a boy. It's a, it's a very misogynistic set of like like women are not even mentioned in this. But it's this set of encyclopedias from the University Press in 1933, and and my dad gave it to me like it was this like precious thing, and I just went, this is. They, and they have beautiful illustrations, so I couldn't destroy them. But I was like, Dad, this should not, this, this is a very outdated thing. Uh, and so I kind of encapsulated it with the relationships with that I had with my dad, you know, and all these bindings and tying and everything. And that kind of comes from being on the farm, too, because that's how we fix stuff. Like if something broke, we usually like tied it together with bale and twine or something like that. Uh, so that that's a very common aesthetic that's been throughout my work. And you can keep going. And I make books. Um, these are all leather bound books because I'm a printmaker. I do have, uh, you know, this kind of love of the sequential nature of what prints are. You know, a lot of old books have original prints and illustrations in them. Uh, and so I kind of consider that piece just before that kind of a book as well, but you just can't open them anymore. Um, and so how do you want to do this? You want to go through slides or you want to stop and chat in between? I mean, I, you know, I, I would love to, I know we're about to kind of get more to your print work. Um, so how did you gravitate? So these are fall in the, the first ones kind of fall in that realm of book arts and maybe sculptural. Um, mm -hmm. How did you gravitate from that to um, more of printmaking? And I'll just start kind of flicking through. Oh, I, uh, I learned about printmaking very early on because there was a printmaker at the Levered Arts and Crafts Center. So I knew what it was. Um, I put these in here, be I guess, because I, I developed these things that are kind of a flavor 
So if you go back to that one just before, so this is, this is kind of like a sextant, you know, that you would measure the horizon of the sun, be able to plot your location. And so navigation and sense of place is a really important theme throughout my work. Uh, and then if you go to the next one, so I, I build these things and I just literally just kind of have fun with them uh, for, and I like them for a couple of reasons. A, if I walked into the woods with a ball of string and a pocket knife, uh, I could, I could produce my work. You know, because printmaking is so intense with, I mean, the, the chemistry and the processes, the supplies, the equipment. Um, but this is kind of set up where you, you get those, those two little things to match up right there. You get it perfectly balanced, and there you are. But if you go, um, these are all kind of symbiotic. So they start to show up in prints. And so that's just a, that's a, a photo litho that's in, embedded in a lithograph. And again, so if it becomes an aesthetic that I really like, and I, I feel like it's speaking to the rest of the process within that print or a series of prints, then I'll, I'll toss it in. So they really go back and forth. It's not just one or the other. They, mm -hmm. they inform each other, but mostly the 3d informs the, um, uh, the prints. And so, yeah, I studied printmaking. I was really lucky because we had great printmakers at the University of Massachusetts, where I was an undergraduate. Um, and then I went to the University of Tennessee, which is ranked number two in printmaking in the country. And during that time, I also studied at the Tamarin Institute for uh, Lithography in New Mexico. I'm a boat builder too, but as you can see, I, I'm not that good. But again, this is just the idea of, um, you know, having fun with that outdoor, just walking through the woods and finding things, you know, seeing things in, in elements that you find and then creating them to be what you want them to be. And then transferring that into the, um, into the work of uh, printmaking. So why don't you tell us about, I know this one and at least the next one, um, or maybe not the next one, uh, the one we just saw, <laughs> um, yeah. you changed into um, uh, coloring sheets. So uh, if yeah. guys, I usually ask everybody to show what you were working on beforehand. Um, so I apologize, I missed that part. But um, why don't you tell us about uh, this one in particular? Yeah, this is, um, I, I picked this out, hoping that you would ask that, thank you. Um, so I worked for a long time, you'll see these hands kind of disembodied, floating around in prints and those are these sort of elements of control as we go along this path you know we think we have control we don't you know it's like things just happen and you know we we can prepare for the worst and hope for the best you know that's kind of a life philosophy <laughs> um and so this is actually um so this ball of string was uh, these things kind of come to me in very meaningful ways. And then I kind of unravel them to, to whether they'll work uh, in my investigation and my artwork or not. And this came from my grandmother's house and she was very poor. She was my mom's mom. And she lived in Northern Appalachia in the Southern tier of New York. And you think New York, but the Southern tier of New York is you know, it, it's Northern Appalachia. And back during the war, the World War II, you know, that era of when my parents were growing up and everybody was sort of going off, you know, in all kinds of different directions, whether it was the African theater or the European theater, Pacific theater. And as a package came, it would be wrapped in string. And then she would carefully take it off and, you know, tie it on. And you can see that there's a knot right next to one of the hands. Uh, and this thing is full of knots. And she would, she created this string ball from all these packages that people had. So this is this interconnectivity of people from all around the world. And it's really a timeline of life. And that's why it's called for, for this long. So it's, it's kind of like you pull the string out and then when you get to the end, time to go. So, um, yeah. And it's, I, I really find it. There's a lot of these things that I find to be 
um, how people maintain relationships over these distances before the internet. You know, you could say that my grandmother invented the internet using this simple string analogy. Well, I no, that that's not true. Never mind. Uh, and you know, boat building is it's just a it's just a love of mine. Uh, boats in general, and because they're such lovely plans, you know, they they like the the schematic development of of a really good skiff is just a beautiful drawing. And so they, they're emblematic of making plans and hoping that, you know, you'll build it, it'll be seaworthy and you'll travel a long adventure in it. Well, some of the greatest uh, or not greatest, but like kind of biggest changes in people's life up until this kind of modern era was them getting on a boat and going elsewhere yep. um, or being forced onto a boat. So like that massive amount of change, I think, um, and then the string of life that's really beautiful. Um, and, and there the is a little, just a, just as a spoiler for later, you see that there's a, a certain amount of lines and that, that, that is a very, very light, um, uh, nod to maps and cartography. And so you'll see it become a bigger thing in my work at a later date and time. Christina, we have a few questions if you've okay. got time. So one of them is, what's your favorite type of printmaking, intaglio, relief, etc.? cetera? Uh, well, I was trained as a master lithographer uh, and a master printmaker. And it's, uh, it's a certificate uh, program from uh, the Tamron Institute. And I love it because that, that process is, it, it's drawing but it's also painting, but it's also photography, but it's also fiber, but it's also, you can, you know, that's what I love about printmaking is it's, li it's literally, it has the ability to be every other medium. Um, and, and woodcut, I do a lot of woodcut and wood engraving as well. Uh, those are definite favorites. I did etching for a long, long time and I love it because it's so solid and I just haven't done it because, you know, it's, it's like a candy shop. Printmaking is a big candy shop. And, you know, you don't want to get sick by trying to eat too much at one time uh, because there's so many processes. And, you know, screen print is huge. Uh, and, and I actually do, and historically throughout my career, have done very little of it uh, because there's other photo processes that I just got comfortable using. And I have another question that was sent to me directly, which is, what's the name of the piece? And I believe they were referring to the piece with the two hands and the boat drawing and string. This one. Yeah, that one. Oh, for this long. Is right. that right? Yes. This is, this is an older piece, so um, I, I might be a little on the titles. That, but, that is the title you sent me. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and Rachel, was that the, I cannot see the chat at all today. Um, yeah, that that, that's all the questions for right now. Okay. Um, great. So, you know, um, I had, I had started kind of going through some of these. Um, so I didn't know if you wanted me to pause on any of these, but, uh, so you, just, go ahead. just to, uh, give a kind of a benchmark, you know, this goes into a whole new series, which is called prime meridian. Um, it's kind of about our time and how we manage and focus or, or learn to, you know, not be caught up in it. Um, but, uh, traditionally printmaking is a, is a matrix that wouldn't get any bigger than say like 22 by 30, maybe 30 by 40. These prints are, uh, 78 inches across. So they're, these are really big sheets of paper. And then, um, so we're going into the sculptural, um, but, uh, uh, oh, actually, no, <laughs> I caught it backwards in my head. Um, so I know one of the questions I had asked you was um, alternative uh, process. So mm -hmm. for those of us on the call that are not um, as into uh, the kind of different forms of art, can you go into alternative process um, and what that means a little bit more? Yeah, it's a it's a it covers a matter of all sins. I think. I mean, people use it for different 
different processes. I mean, when I think of alternative processes, I'm, I'm really thinking about photography and using different processes other than just like lens based uh, shooting. Um, but like, for example, you know, go back one. So this was from an installation and there were like a, a multitude of pieces in this and there was a soundtrack and this was meant to be a uh, walk through. And so this, um, this outlet that seems to have wings is tethered to a, uh, an outlet in the room. And there's several other very similar sculptures. Um, and it's just a talk about, uh, you know, our dependence on energy and how we're trying to manage it now, now we, how we have to curb it now. And, and the fact that, you know, we, we can't really break free. We are literally tethered. And it was actually called uh, June bug on a string. Cause if you're not familiar with that colloquialism, people used to be like to make a toy, they catch a June bug, these big buzzing, you know, cicada like things and tie a string around it and then let them fly around while they held them on a string. And that, that was a toy for a child. Um, and you know, it wasn't good for the bug and wasn't really good for holistically for our well being and soul, if you will. Um, and that's kind of our relationship with energy. If you look, if you think about it. So if you go to the next one and again, like I, I turned that into, uh, this use for, um, the print medium. Ah, this is a wonderful piece. I love this piece. Um, so in 1999, if folks out there remember, uh, we had the Y2K. Uh, all the computers were going to crash because they couldn't handle, you know, the, the four letter uh, numbers, 2000. And, and we, we really got ready. Uh, but it was a really fun time to be an artist because everybody was having you know, end of the millennium shows, 1999 shows, uh, end of the world shows. Mm -hmm. And so I was invited to be in this show that was literally, I forget what it was called, but it was, uh, something about like the world coming to an end. And I was like, or at least if the lights go out, what are we going to need? And I said, well, we're going to need a flashlight. And I kind of, I went back to that kind of barn aesthetic of putting things mm -hmm. together that I have. Like, I don't really like things to be clean and joined and everything. I like them. Yeah, I like to, I really love to find these things in old barns too, but this I made and just like in a, in a day, I was just kind of thinking, I went out into my studio and I had all this stuff laying around and I just made this funny flashlight. Cause I was like, well, if all the lights go out, this is a, this is an obvious thing that we're going to need. And this led to making probably a hundred plus flashlights in the same kind of style. And so I, I kind of, I, I went into uh, about a year period where I was not really making too many prints at all because I was really enjoying this and then creating when, when we talk about the alternative process, you know, that installation, that, um, that experience when you walk in, there's sound, you know, and, and these, these were kind of takeaways from the show, if you will. Like I was talking to a gallerist that I was working with and uh, they said, well, that's great, but do you have anything that I could sell? <laughs> because that's, I'm like, yeah, sure. Like let's make these flashlights. And, you know, I started collecting flashlights and you, know, you think about like, we don't do it anymore because flashlights are now these, like, it's like everything it's becomes, you know, we got a flashlight on this thing. And, you know, people are like, oh, I have a flashlight. And I'm like, nah, it's not a flashlight. But it used to be that, you know, you'd, you'd screw them and unscrew them and then you bang them a few times and then, you know, they'd flicker and then the light would go out and then you were in trouble. And it, they just, they carried this sense of comfort and, and kind of doom at the same time because it would always be like, oh, let the flashlight's out of batteries. Or you could use it for entertainment and do the flashlight under the, you know, ghost shadow shows. puppets. Yeah, uh -huh. And they just, they just became these really kind of fun and interesting things. And I'll say this and, uh, um, you know, 
I had this show the first time that I exhibited these and, and there was, I was in a, a very, um, uh, a conservative area. Uh, and so people were coming to the show and these women who supported the gallery would get out and come in and they'd walk around and then they'd run back out to the car and they would li literally tell their husbands, they would be like, okay, you, finally, you're going to like this show. And I thought that was a compliment, but it was also kind of a sad commentary at the same time. Um, so, you know, uh, but, but they really, they, they drew a, a lot of uh, interesting conversation and they became a lot of fun to, you know, I was having conversations like I've never had at an art opening before. And, mm -hmm. they, and they were really, uh, they were very genuine and, and, and so, you know, it wasn't really something that I was going to sustain for a long time, but for that, you know, a little over a year, maybe 14 months or so, I, I, I made like a ton of these and they and they were just fun. And, you know, like one, one guy purchased one, one of the ones back there. And he said that, um, he, he's a collector and his, his wife is a, a big collector in Atlanta and he said, Rich, I love this thing because um, I need a flashlight for my grill, you know, outside the back door. Uh, but Anne won't let me, you know, like just have a flashlight sitting there. But mm -hmm. if it's sitting on a pedestal and it's a piece of art, like this is good. And I, I just, it, it was a wonderful uh, kind of connection. Uh, but like I said, it's not a, a sustainable thing that I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. It was sort of happenstance and, um, and it was fun for well yeah. elastic yeah so are you um more so you you tend to draw on a lot of environment and nature but also your past experiences and everything what do you find you are most influenced by um well i mean since the start of your career but uh continuously as we go um did you feel like you were influenced more by current events or like the y2k bug or, you know, the environment, or is it kind of a... a well, generally, of it's my surroundings. I mean, I'm not overtly political. Um, there are people who do that and do it really well. Uh, these are all kind of weather-based. This is from, you know, years ago uh, when we first, not first, but, you know, we, there was still a lot of denial of climate change. And these are kind of weather stations and these kind of interesting storms. And, you know, I, they would be sort of storms of uh, ink and paper in a way. Um, and so, you know, I wanted, to I wanted to acknowledge that and investigate it, but I didn't want it to be about, like, this is just about climate change. Um, you know, they always have, they address it a little bit, depending on what's going on. And this is kind of the belief system, uh, you know, on the left panel. Uh, that's a... a uh, schematic of uh you know in art history you have to look at this it's a cathedral mm -hmm. um, i'm trying to think like the floor plan looking down and you know you got to learn to label all the parts and everything and so to me that's a system of belief and and you know whatever people's are is great um and then the fire tower which is this kind of defunct thing that's ghostly there aren't really any working fire towers anymore. You know, we, we used to watch out for, um, there's a few, uh, but, um, so, you know, the, there would be ecology. I mean, there's always environment, um, a real, a sense of place, like where I am, like I've moved around a lot in my career and I've been in radically different types of environments you know, where I was living and it takes a little while for it to soak in, but that is usually the main informant of my work. And then other things kind of, you know, will rise and go. And mm -hmm. if, as we get on here, you know, you'll see that things get a little more political just because of the way. So, Christina, so we have another, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Rich. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Question. Oh, we just had a, another question that was sent to me. Uh, Rich, what is your advice for young artists? Be curious and be ferocious. Um, you know, I look back 
And um, one of our colleagues was kind of hit on this at our, our orientation the other day, last Friday. And, and it, it's like when we look back at our 18 year old selves going, you know, into art school and things, and, you know, we kind of fooled around with this and we fooled around with that and we kind of took things seriously and we sort of, you know, I, I would just, I didn't take as many chances to get outside my comfort zone. Um, and I didn't, I didn't focus in, you know, for a long time within my art career. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say be curious and be ferocious. Well, and that leads me to another question that um, I had told you I wanted to ask was we've had a lot of people who are working artists on. We've had um, artists that are also professors, but you've also taken a track of going into arts administration as well. Um, being a chair um, and being a chair in several different places. Can you tell us about your journey to get into academia and then also into arts administration? And then I know I'll, I'll tell me to pause and I'll just kind of keep flipping through some of these. And then if you want to talk about the, the specific piece of art as well. Um, well, you stay here for a minute. Um, right. So I, uh, Let's see the the journey of academia first. Yeah, I, I ever since I was five years old, I've gone to school every you know September. <laughs> and um, you know, my dad was a professor. He was a professor of political science, and my mom taught business administration at Greenfield College. Uh, and so you know, they created uh, an arts administrator. <laughs> <laughs> in academia. Um, I, I wasn't really thinking about it that much until, and, and my dad was my best friend. We just, we, we I adored each other. Uh, he was my harshest critic and my best friend. Um, and, and he, he kind of badgered me a little bit after I got my BFA and I had been working for a little while. Um, I worked in the trades, um, and, you know, I was like, ah, you know, I had a, I had an electrical license, I had a contractor's license, and yeah, you know, I could have done it. It's not really like I didn't like it, but he he kind of saw that happening, I think. And this is the first time I've ever revealed this. Um, and and we had lunch at the faculty club at the University of Massachusetts because he was still teaching at the time, and we saw all of his friends that I knew and his colleagues, and they, like I grew up with them all around and. And he, I mean, he got really stoic and he said, I want to go to grad school. And I was like, okay. Um, because it was coming from somebody that I, I cared about that much and he cared. So that little bit of a push, I mean, it, it was, I was thinking about it, but I wasn't really following through on it. And then after that, uh, it was like, my hair was on fire. I was just, I was just going to do it, you know, mm -hmm. because when you do go to graduate school, you have a 3% chance of winding up where I am. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I'm just, and it didn't happen right away. I had some seriously mattered jobs in between finishing graduate school and my first full-time teaching position. Uh, so, you know, I mean, you just can't give up because, you know, mm -hmm. you know, What's the old saying? Quitters never win and winners never quit. That kind of thing, you know. I, <laughs> but but it was just like just just don't quit. And and one a, a chair that I worked for a long time ago, you know, he said he said you know as long as you keep trying, you, every, you'll make mm -hmm. it. Just don't give up. But but it did. I mean, I, I was an adjunct for eight eight and a half years. Uh, and I was applying all those times and it was like, no, 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 no. And then finally I got in and there was a, there was like a, a real immediate response. And so within, within a year, I was kind of the reluctant chair of that department. Um, and, and I have been ever since, you know, I've been, this is my 20th year of being a chair or a director or something. So I, I don't know, administration just seemed, you know, I've, I've coached, uh, I always seem to get pushed out in front somehow, um, you know, growing up. And so it, it was sort of a natural thing. And, 
maybe it's the political science part of growing up with uh, my dad. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it's, it's fun and it's, it's challenging and I like to build. Um, but, you know, the, the thing is, it's just, it is such a good job. Mm -hmm. it is, it's the best job in the world. I mean, it's lifelong learning. You know, my career has taken me all around the world. Uh, I've met the best and worked with the best people and still continue to. <laughs> and, um, and it's, it's wonderful. You know, it's just, and, you know, I mean, some people are like, well, yeah, you know, you, you, you and actually a good friend of mine who is a retired professor, she said, well, the one good thing about school is that the semester always comes to an end. And I was <laughs> like, that's a, that's that's a really but, good And then you get to try again the next semester too. Yeah, you get to evaluate what worked and didn't and improve. So it's yeah, you get to continuously improve and and you know they and students come through your life and you know you know now I've got students who are they're 40 years old and you know they and I'm thinking of their their shy introverted, you know, 18-year-old selves and, you know, now because of social media, we're able to stay in contact. You know, and they, they're doing these great things. They've got these fabulous jobs and families. And I'm like, oh, oh, I thought you were still 20 because I still like feel like I'm 35. I it's, I've always viewed academia kind of like an exhibit. It's really great to be able to be on that development end and then see the finished product at the end, which is sometimes just the graduation. They made it through they got that job and that's rewarding too. But then you have those students that stay in touch and you get to kind of see them grow yeah. in development too. So I feel like that's also, um, but I love that you, you said it went back to that building aspect. Um, and that ties into kind of how you, um, you have yeah. your, your sculptural pieces and then the working on the farm and everything. Um, so tell us about this particular piece. So these are, these pieces are uh, smoke on paper. Uh, this series was, based around kind of an investigation of power. Cause I was, you know, I, I was just at this point where I, I seemed to be coming into contact with a lot of people who had power, but decided that they would abuse it instead of using it for good. And when people get power, you know, they are authority or, or however you want to look at it. They, they kind of use it in all kinds of different ways. And also I was living uh, in Texas, not very far from uh, like miles of refineries, which is frightening. Um, and so that last piece was a, um, so this is a, a tube, uh, diode cathode tube from, uh, you know, like an old radio or TV, you know, uh, in the back, they used to have a whole series of these tubes. And the purpose of these uh, is to manage and uh, amplify power. And they were just kind of a nice metaphor to kind of play around with. And so I did these diptychs and you can go to the, the Derek. Um, and I did these diptychs because, you know, there were a lot of accident, environmental accidents happening. Um, and I think this was, you know, kind of playing off the, uh, uh, the, the BP oil rig that blew up in the Gulf, uh, one of them. And, you know, so one of these is, is kind of like inflamed with smoke and about to kind of let go. And then the second one, it, it's too late. That's the, that's the like abandoned ship kind of piece. So these diptychs are kind of um, a turning point, you know, of going past the 11th hour environmentally. Uh, also, I was using oil to burn. Um, also, everybody, Make sure you pay attention to art history. This is actually, um, this is actually in homage to the standard uh, by Ed Ruscha, uh, the very famous screen print and painting. Um, and this is just called the new standard. Uh, but this, you know, I was using oil-based gasoline to to create these drawings with smoke. And so this, this is all just smoke on paper there. And it's very ethereal. It's kind of, a, you know, it doesn't really exist until, you know, it really starts to get into the paper. And then it's, 
yeah, it takes a long time to control. So and then, these. yeah. So these are uh, cyanotypes. These are alternative photoprocesses. And a cyanotype is developed in the sun. And it's, well, it's developed in the sun. Well, it's exposed, I'm sorry, in the sun and then developed in water. So it's completely inert. It's, uh, and this is my alternative process. So I was making pieces that were based on, um, you know, the fossil fuel industry and the alternative fuel industry and they kind of went back and forth in this particular exhibition. And I'm a, I'm just a big tool guy. I just love, you know, I have tons of antique tools and um, I, I don't, you know, they're, they're, they're part of it, but they're also part of the building and construction and, and everything. Um, and it, some of them kind of play off and then this was, uh, I was invited to be in a portfolio uh, in Germany. And we were starting, things were getting, there were a lot of flashpoints. And so I didn't want to respond completely uh, in terms of politics. But I'll always put a little something in there to remember that, you know, we are the people. Anyway, most politicians can't actually reference the origin of that text. <laughs> But um, so what have you been working on during the pandemic and have you been, and has the pandemic uh, influenced? Uh, yeah, yeah we, can go th we can go through these um, because, okay. so these are USGS maps that I'll sew uh, like a cannon fuse, like a regular fuse, you know, Wiley Coyote, you know, and, um, and I'll just, the, Living in South Texas, you know, the land was scarred. And so it's just, and also, you know, most of my students, I, I work, Texas A&M and Corpus Christi is a Hispanic serving institution. Most of my students came from the Rio Grande Valley, which is down along where you see. And the USGS maps, like, are pretending that there's nothing across the, the river. You know, in a lot of cases, you'll see it's just like, it's not there. Sometimes it is there. Sometimes it's not. Um this follows the particular uh, Rio Grande itself. And so these fuses, it's another kind of system of, you know, when you think about a lit fuse and how that could be a political metaphor, a social metaphor, uh, you know, an environmental metaphor, um, I, they can be, I put them out there to be whatever, you know, the viewer wants to take in on that. But, um, but they, they're fun to play with. I mean, I mean, I have a lot of fuse and then uh, pulling these together a lot of times. So if you, if, I don't know if you can see, probably if you guys are looking on an iPhone, you can't, but I'll, I'll scour over hundreds and hundreds of these USGS maps. Sorry, I'm getting texts and I'll look for the title in the map somewhere or even some of the content. So for example, this is called hell's half acre. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with that term, but my mom used to <laughs> use that term all the time. And she'd be like, you know, I mean, her, her sort of, you know, you've got this stuff scattered all over hell's half acre. And, and like in this, and I was like, wow, there's really a place that's, that's that. Um, and then you kind of start thinking like, what do you suppose hell's half acre Texas looks like? And it's probably just a little drilling place. So there's my antique drill. Uh, then again, this is, so uh, just to explain, so this is a map that's uh, mounted onto Reeves BFK rag paper. And then there's a emulsion that's painted on to the top section. And then that is exposed and then developed in water. Christina, I know we're getting towards the end of time, and I was wondering if I could ask the last question that I've gotten in the chat. Go for it. Yeah. So what or who were your early art influences, magazine illustrations, comic books, certain artists? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I was very, again, very fortunate. I was raised around a place where you know artists lived, and uh, Barry Mosier, who's a really uh, famous illustrator, like he, he illustrated the Bible. 
you know, your, your career is going pretty good, pretty well when you get invited yeah. to a job like that. Uh, but anyway, he, he was an incredible and still to this day, incredible illustrator, uh, and artist, painter, wood engraver. Um, uh, some of my faculty actually, uh, Jack Coughlin, another great illustrator, uh, Fred Becker, um, you know, WPA artist. Uh, you know, I, I was I was fortunate enough to get to know these people towards the end of their career. I didn't, not comic books. I, there were only a couple comic books that I ever really had, you know, because we, we didn't have that really available to us because we were out in the country when I was a kid. And so then in high school and stuff, I never really got into it. And, um, uh, and then just, you know, as I was going through books, you know, I would, and, and we had a couple of like really cheap knockoff, uh, posters in our house of, um, of, you know, Andrew Wyeth and, uh, you know, John Singer Sargent. And I remember staring at those for hours. Uh, so th that kind of got me going and then really, and then once I got going, I mean, I really relied on art historians to like fill that coffer of influences. Um, mm -hmm. you know, when I've started formally studying, uh, and so, and then today, you know, I have some contemporaries that work in, you know, smoke and similar, uh, work, but, um, you know, uh, just some of the. Some of the greats, uh, I'm a huge Rauschenberg fan, a huge Jasper Johns fan, just be, you know, the way they, because of the way they worked with their imagery. Um, and then uh, some of the, some of the, the greats of the European age. I, I love the, the, like the post world war sculptors that came out of Europe, Brankowski and people like that, you know, because some of the themes that they worked on, I, I work on too, but I just work in such a different medium. It doesn't look like we're, we're talking about the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, so there's that. And you can move on to the next one. Next one. So this is, so this is a smoke on paper. This obviously references, um, you know, you asked about the pandemic. This obviously references January 6th. Um, I'm not interested in the politics of it because that's, that's crazy. Um, however, it does make me think about, I, I was trying to figure out like what the smoke element meant to me now, right now, like being in Birmingham and no longer in Texas. Uh, and you, when we think about these broad things that people argue about, uh, about like democracy and freedom, and it is such a fleeting thing that like goes through your hands like smoke because, you know, when we look at it objectively, I mean, you could say that we're free or you could say that we're completely incarcerated in our culture uh, or by our culture. And so I'm doing a series. I, I just I'm going to show this one. Um, and I'm this is just a test run because there's the devil's backbone. Uh, so I'm just kind of anyway playing around with that. But I'm doing I have a solo show coming up and I've been working on these uh, and I'm, I'm not going to show any more of these because well i have a show coming up but they're mon it's called monuments and it's a testament to the way we look at monuments and what they mean and the like i said the ethereal nature of i mean these arguments uh or debates that what which is what i would like them to be uh about you know the fact of what they mean to different people and the fact that people can't really see that so so then this, the meeting, the meetings just get so incredibly convoluted and, you know, what do we do with them? I mean, do they go someplace where they'll be seen ever again? Um, and, and I'm kind of looking right now, the research is like, of course, like a couple of the very recognizable ones, but I've been very interested by some of the monuments that are completely unrecognizable uh, to like the trail of tears monument. Like nobody would know that if I showed, even if I showed you a slide of the real thing, um, you know, because there are some very obscure things and talking about our history and past. And like I said, I don't want it to be overtly political, but you know, the flashpoints of the last year were what, what affected me the most throughout mm -hmm. the pandemic. And so that's, and it's not like I got to know Birmingham, 
because I got to know my basement. I got to know this place. <laughs> so, um, so that's the work that I'm doing right now. And, um, and I, I think we're probably close to time if there's any other questions. Rachel, was there any more? I do not see any more. Great. Well, I'm going to go ahead and stop share here. Um, Rich, this is wonderful. I learned things that I didn't know about your artwork. Um, can you tell us when and where your uh, upcoming show is going to be? Uh, it's at Jefferson. Is that what it's called? Jefferson State College. It's over there. Um, Jackson, Jacksonville State. Jacksonville State. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Jefferson is down in. I'm just getting to know my way around still. I was only here six months before we all had to go home. That's true. You were. I forgot about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, I did. I I was almost getting to know my way around Birmingham, and then the pandemic hit. Um, yeah, so it's at uh, uh, Jacksonville State, and it's I want to say March ish. I'll have to look it up. I, I'm, awesome. I'm just looking. I, I figured, like you know, like I'll, I'll go look that up later. But yeah. I think that's that's about what <laughs> I did. Great. Thank you so much, Rich. This has been wonderful. Um, I am going to take away our spotlights and uh, put us into grid view. So if you guys uh, have been working on something during this talk, I would love to see. I, I did mine early, so um, you can hold it up and share, Yay. even if you weren't working on one of the artworks. Great. Okay. Well, thank you guys. Um, and uh, don't forget our next uh, coloring night is October 7th. Thank you so much, Rich. This is wonderful. I thought this was the perfect kind of kickoff to our, oh, look, so more. Oh, wow. uh, <laughs> this is the perfect kickoff to the semester. Thank you so, Jeannie so much. Flint. <laughs> how did you... That's great. Jeannie Flint, how do you sneak in here? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. All right. Thank you. I really appreciate Thank you, it. Rich. Yes, we appreciate it too. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.